Yes. Okay, okay. Is she ready? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's what she is ready. Actually. So instruction. Give me for the answer. Give now. Give now. No problem. Okay. Sir. Start now. Okay, Malay. You can start. No problem. Okay, sir. Fine, sir. Instructions to the participants. Participants are requested to mute, mute your mic during the presentation session. You will be allowed to unmute your mic only during the discussion session to ask your queries. And you will also you can also post your questions in the chat box during the session. Feedback form will be posted in the chat box only at the end of the session, and it will be active for thirty minutes. Thank you. Anna, can we start the program now? Okay. So good afternoon to all. I am Vasi Malai, coordinator of this FTP MSNT 2020. i welcome you all for this ninth day ftp event so today's speaker is my best friend and a, such a nice gentleman so me and dr vijay kumar we worked at taiwan at the professor cs ek laboratory i we can say i, I can say uh, dr vijay kumar is my postdoctoral senior and he is now working as a scientist d uh, institute of science and technology it's a uh, a nano science nano technology it's a team it's a autonomous body of dst so thanks a lot for your kind acceptance of our invitation na for this pandemic period now hand over the session to immaculate mercy a pleasant evening and a warm welcome to one and all present in this meeting on faculty development program material science and nanotechnology 2020 on behalf of bs abdul rahman present institute of science and technology department of chemistry all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered the point is to discover them this is a famous quote by galileo according to this quote we are all traveling together in discovering and enhancing our knowledge each and every day from this program today we are in the day 9 of 14 days faculty development program on material science and nanotechnology 2020 the speaker of today's session is dr ps vijay kumar sir scientist d institute of nano science and technology an autonomous research institute of dst mohali punjab topic of today's session is recent trends in agricultural nanotechnology before entering into the session it's my privilege to introduce today's chief guest dr ps vijay kumar sir is currently working as scientist d at the institute of nano science and technology mohali punjab he obtained his phd from tamil nadu agriculture university coimbatore in the year 2006 after his phd he worked as a post doctoral fellow at the department of biotechnology at national chemical laboratory pune under professor b l prasad from 2007 to 2009 then he moved to national chengkong university taiwan and worked as a post doctoral fellow under the supervision of professor shengshang ya from 2010 to 2014 he has published more than 30 papers with high impact factor journals and filed two patents and he also published one book chapter he is guiding five phd scholars and produced several master pro project students and currently he is running several projects from serp and dst nano mission he has received many awards and honors and he is also the reviewer of several journals including american chemical society royal society of chemistry elsewell journals his research area covers nanotechnology in food processing fruit cell life extension nano sensor for plant and pesticide and nutrition delivery there are lot more to say about our chief guest anyways i conclude with this and i hand over the session to dr ps vijay kumar sir thank you so uh, i think uh, this is uh, 4:15 so i can say both good afternoon good evening okay to all and uh, before going to the talk uh, let me thank the organizer crescent uh, department of chemistry institute of science and technology dean to be university and uh, especially i want to extend this gratitude to my friend uh, wasimalai and the coordinator of this program 
so uh, as he mentioned uh, some eight years before we were having an overlap in sergey's lab in taiwan and uh, to highlight the lab uh, it is uh, it, uh, it is one of the top 10 cited labs as per thomson and reuters survey uh, for the year 2014 so there we were doing some uh, photothermal hyperthermia materials for the cancer uh, drug delivery systems i little bit touch on that okay how it metamorphized to uh, agricultural targeted delivery system i will explain that okay and i further extend my uh, gratitude to ms mercy for being so uh, like uh, elaborate in uh, introducing me uh, with such a kind words okay so now uh, coming to the topic recent uh, trends in agriculture so i am vijay kumar as it is said and i am from institute of nanoscience and technology so it is a dst institute i i have couple of uh, slides to introduce our institute and after those slides uh, there will be a small uh, kind of introduction about the future forms uh, how the nanotechnology have already started playing role in these things and then uh, we'll uh, move to what we are doing in our lab okay so in that uh, i'll be covering a uh, few of the recent works that we have made on fertilizer uh, most of us most of our uh, work will be towards targeted uh, application of uh, fertilizer pesticide preservatives uh, whatever it may be for the agricultural application okay so this is our institute actually it is uh, government of india's initiation uh, in 2010 afterwards uh, it was approved in the parliament and uh, the institute was started to exclusively work on nano science this is the first kind in the country to work exclusively on nano science and uh, our first director uh, took charge in 2013 and uh, it was initiated in the building that is on the uh, top right okay the orange building it is a government community building Uh, in uh, mohali this is just 1 km from the uh, cricket stadium where you will be seeing all mohali or mohali matches okay so that is where we reside and uh, we are around 35 faculties working from different areas covering all the areas but uh, our uh, aim will be to use nanotechnology for different application so we are very soon within next 15 to 20 days we are going to move to our own campus which you are seeing at the bottom a big uh, attractive building that is uh, in uh, blue color in a background of sky uh, blue uh, it's the sky okay so it is just some 3 kilometers from the stadium uh, which is located here so in the new uh, building will be going in a more uh, fast pace as because of the space and also we'll be hiring more students and uh, also faculties from uh, like your institute uh, can come for an uh, exchange kind of things to the uh, summer interns and other things see uh, like uh, as it is a faculty development program i should also mention you that you should always uh, have a look into the current science advertisements okay so in the current science they will be giving advertisements from uh, different funding agency dst dbt drdo uh, dae etc etc okay so there will there are many faculty development programs where there is like a two month program they'll give a funding uh, for the like uh, travel and other assistance uh, so you can come and uh, in these fundings we majorly provide a uh, accommodation as well so it will be kind of a two months program where you can reside in the scientist whichever the scientist you are interested in in his lab you can reside and you can know what is happening 
and uh, you can also synthesize those materials take it back to your institute and uh, try to do some small work in the application with it. as you'll be having many students with you Uh, since because you are a academic institute you'll be having more uh, hands to help you so you can to take those materials for application and it can initiate some small sort of uh, collaboration with other things which can mutually help uh, both inst and uh, the institutes students as well okay so what are all the areas that we work on uh, we span from uh, chemical biology sensors and diagnostics soft nanostructures uh, environment and, and energy uh, nanostructure devices computational nanoscience strategic materials nano for agriculture cancer therapeutics so here uh, you can say almost every area is covered there is no area that is uh, uncovered uh, some of them work on infectious disease uh, leishmaniasis uh, uh, and other uh, pharma activities and uh, polymer soft polymer uh, nanostructures sensors energy and environment as you can see everything is covered and uh, everything is supported with our uh, state of the art facility so everything under one roof that is what our uh, uh, like uh, head head of the institution says uh, this is the best of the facility that is in that is in the country so everything in a single roof where uh, you can do this uh, all the characterization starting from tem scm air pump uh, raman uh, femtosecond laser spectroscopy and uh, uh, ir uv uh, cd dsc uh, bet surface area photocatalytic application testing hplc xrd uh, what not electrochemistry application Uh, everything 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 is in a single roof so you can like explore uh, whatever you want uh, with your own imagination in different fields okay uh, coming to the future farm so this is how the future farm is going to be so when the civilization started the first occupation that uh, human kind have started is agriculture so uh, the human was uh, moving hunting eating and moving right so the first time he saw the grain that is dropped from his hand that grows he was amused at it okay he was interested in it and then the small colonization of the forest into uh, field started okay that is where the agriculture started and uh, over the thousands of years it has uh, grown so much to feed us today we are all getting food because of so many uh, revolution that has happened in this agriculture in these due course of time uh, so no more hunger is there only hidden hungers are there that is kind of nutrient malnutrition uh, nutrient deficiency all these things happens but no more uh, hunger is there uh, mostly even in the developing and underdeveloped country there is no more hunger we can say so how this has happened uh, you may remember the famine that has happened uh, in 1980 70s okay and it struck our country as well so there was a global famine that was happening so that time the green revolution happened so before that also there was uh, many uh, advancement in agriculture but a significant move happened at uh, 1980s uh, uh, 50s to 80s as that is a green revolution where high yielding crops were uh, developed okay so uh, when there was a shortage of wheat uh, the nobel laureate uh, professor uh, norman borlaug uh, when walking into the field of wheat uh, was uh, uh, amused to seeing some of the wheat variety wheat plant that is growing very short okay uh, they were going growing very short and at that star short length they were giving panicle and the grains okay 
so then he took those uh, collected those plants and crossed it with the regular variety and then they came the short term variety okay and that was extended to all the plants okay all the plants of commercial uh, commercial importance have been uh, explored with the same uh, principle and then like all short duration variety with high yielding capacity was developed and as you all are from south you must be knowing samba variety which used to grow to 5.5 uh, feet of height okay now no more varieties grow more than 2 feet 2 or 2 and a half feet is the maximum okay all the feet is constrained almost up the height and uh, uh, we started giving panicle at that height and uh, growth is reduced from 6 months to 3 months to 60 days okay so that is how the reduction has happened and the yield is also increasing okay so <clears throat> how to reduce further more here comes the nanotechnology as you are seeing the left side big panel that is vertical forming okay this is not a kind of lab okay this is a commercially grown uh, plants for to cater the consumers uh, around new york okay although the country that is united states have huge uh, land uh, resource and good water resource they are not able to transport those plants that is needed in the city okay so they find this more economical than transporting plants from the field that is uh, located far away so here what is the role of nanotechnology you can see that completely it is eliminated with the leds okay this is all semiconductor nanoparticle which is able to give high efficient light with low amount of energy consumption okay so here what you are doing is the plant is going to a 24 by 7 okay so then you are able to reduce the of course there is a strict uh, photo period that is maintained but that we are all trying to overcome this photo period uh, rotation of 8 hours by 16 hours of light and dark okay that is being tried to overcome with these leds and if that we are going to then still there will be a reduction in the crop uh, time okay and this is all happened because of uh, some 20, 20 years before israel israel is developed the hydroponic kind of uh, uh, plant growth that is shown in the right top panel okay that is completely with water there is no soil whatever the soil supports that is given in the form of liquid that is called hydroponic cultivation of plants and uh, the right bottom the drone is flying okay this is an experimental field that is from uh, europe so which shows uh, it is a project okay where uh, some 2 hectares that is 5 acre of land has been occupied and it is the trial is going for past 3 years where nobody have entered the field physically okay the field is not touched by any food okay so right from the uh, crop uh, uh, land uh, preparation that is plowing puddling and then uh, sowing and then the growing and then uh, irrigating weeding everything is done mechanistically with robots okay and here for each of the robot there is a sensors needed okay this is all coming through the nanotechnology and as you can see the drones are going there having the infrared ca camera spect spectroscopic camera say for example uh, you want to test the nutrient uh, level in the soil these drones can go and they can take spectral image it is not the ir image it is the spectral image and we can train the machine Uh, it is a machine learning technique where you can uh, analyze the spectra and make the robots to take the decision what to go for uh, whether to nutrient application or for the pesticide application whatever it may be so this is how the next generation agriculture is going okay so coming next next uh, what we are doing in our lab okay so uh, in the right side 
the schematic that is given number one under the soil the production happens right so for the production you need to apply fertilizer so we are working on fertilizer and then the crop grows up once the seed is sown the root starts and then the shoot comes out and the shoot starts the pest starts coming okay then we have to apply pesticide for for the protection okay so we are working on some pesticide formulation and then the yield comes it can be fruit it can be the grain it can be uh, anything else even the foliage okay if it is having edible property and then those things you have to preserve it after harvest so preservative we are working on how to give the preservative in a targeted fashion and then processing how to use nanotechnology there are some functional materials in nano uh, in nano materials right it is optically active it is magnetically active these have a potential application in processing field okay so this is what we are doing in nutshell fertilizer pesticide preservative and processing okay how it like it it got developed and it all started from as i have told uh, it all started from the training in different labs of course the more more high impact uh, is from the professor yes lab where we were working on targeted therapy so targeted therapy can be two way one is internal targeting that is uh, through antibody or some of the small molecules like folic acid say for example if it is a cancer it uh, it have high amount of uh, uh, folate receptor so once you are uh, modifying your particle with the functional uh, surface functional uh, functionalized uh, folic acids that can be easily targeted to the cancer cells that is over expressing these folate receptors okay these are all kind of internal uh, targeting that you follow apart from cancer it it, it extends to other uh, tissues as well say if it is neurogen degenerative disease say for example acetylcholine synthesis is uh, reduced and if this enzyme is reduced there is some uh, precursor that is in, uh, enhanced that have the ability of uh, uh, modifying the redox condition and if your particle is having some redox sensitivity so uh, the redox sense based uh, release can happen this is all internal targeting okay so there is something called external targeting that is uh, called uh, uh, mostly through hyperthermia okay when your particle is having the ability to respond to external stimuli and give a local heat and if your particle is having the drug cargo with some polymer material which is uh, responsive to the uh, temperature so you can design material that can be delivered when you give the stimuli externally say for example magnetic particles magnetic particles when the rf frequency is given since because it is a high frequency the poles exchange and heat is developed and those heat is uh, transduced to the polymer by the magnetic particle and those uh, thermosensitive polymer degrades and releases the drug this is how external targeted uh, therapy happens okay uh, similarly we were working on photothermal nanoparticles say on the right you can see those are gold nano rods this all started with gold nanoparticles okay so these metal particles have plasmons most of you are from chemistry background so you know very well the plasmons are the electron cloud that is on the nanoparticle when it is the particle is condensed to uh, three dimensionally to nano range the plasmons exist that starts uh, rotating in synchronize with the visible radiation okay so this rotation when it is having a frequency orientation with uh, any specific wavelength Uh, then it shows that color and it absorbs it. Okay, say for example, gold nano rod shows a wine red color and uh, it absorbs at five twenty nanometers. Okay, so this absorbed energy have to be some way transformed, right? So it transduces these energy as heat. Okay, then it becomes a photothermal nano particles. Okay, so when these particles are used for drug delivery systems. 
because it is 520 nanometers absorbance, so these uh, radiation do not penetrate much into the tissue. Okay, so we have to see some nanoparticles that have the absorbance, having the uh, absorbance in the range that can penetrate inside. So the radiation that can very well penetrate is NIR radiation. Okay. So uh, NIR radiation is having uh, lower frequency, lower energy, so higher wavelength. Okay. So uh, what people thought is to expand the material in one dimension so that the nano rod is formed. Okay. When the rod is formed, the, the plasmons that is residing here at the uh, longitudinal ends, okay, that rotates in a slower uh, rate than the transverse radiation, transverse uh, rotation, okay. So that rotation, since it is slower, it needs lower energy or the lower frequency or the higher wavelengths, that is the NIR absorbance. That is what happens with these nano rods that is on the top, okay, that absorbs 808 nanometers. So 808 radiation have higher de depth of penetration in the plant tissue. So once you are having drug and the polymer that is uh, loaded in these particles, uh, gets this heat that is transferred from the 808 absorbance and the drug is released, okay. So, but still if you want to increase the depth of penetration, you have to have the uh, absorbance tuned to further more second biological window, okay, that occurs at 1030 range, okay. So here, uh, if you want to follow the same principle, okay, to increase the length and uh, get a nanoparticle with 1030 nanometer absorbance, you have to go to micron range, okay. So maintaining the aspect ratio, you have, see, mind that you have to keep the same uh, transverse size and increase the longitudinal size. Only then you will get but like when you use the present solution-based synthesis, this is all CTAB assisted synthesis, okay? When you increase the length, the thickness also will increase. So you will ma maintain the same absorbance, 808 nanometer absorbance. You won't have a redshift further, okay? So the other concept is there, that is the uh, plasmon hybridization. Say what, uh, what is there in the down, okay? Here you can see, rod and shell, okay, there is a rod over which there is a shell, okay, so there is a hollow gap in between, so there is a plasmon here and there is a plasmon here, okay, there is a plasmon here and there is a plasmon here in the shell, okay, so the plasmon hybridization happens there and this hybridization helps in shifting the uh, absorbance further more to the NIR ring, okay, that goes to the bi second biological ring. But how to create this rod and shell uh, structure as it is here? This is a schematic that we start with a hypothesis, okay? So how we have gone is through coating the gold nanorod with silver nanoparticle, silver, okay? So the, there is a, a low intense silver that is covering the uh, gold nanorod that is intense at the core, okay? And then we sink this material in the gold solution so the gold started, uh, starts to etch the silver, okay? Because the redox uh, value of silver is lesser than the gold. The gold starts easily reducing, taking the electron from the silver. And then this kind of gold shell starts to grow on the gold nanoparticle and this gap occurs. So this helps in the hybridization. And as you can see, the 808 nanometer gets a blue shift with the silver coating and then it goes to uh, red shift with a thousand nanometer range. Okay, though, so that gives a higher penetration and uh, the heat generation will be efficient. So you can treat the uh, disease that is lying deep inside the tissue, okay? This is all kind of uh, motivation that gave to pursue targeted therapy with the functional nanoparticle. Okay, so how to target in plants? As the human system is very, very well developed, there may be a question that how this will happen in plants. Okay, plants are even more uh, 
dynamic, unique. Okay, one plant to one, one plant to other plant itself. There is so many physiological difference. There are so many hormonal changes. Okay, each one is unique. Say for example, transport. The transport of molecule that happens in the xylem do not happen in the phloem. Okay, and the same way, those transport that happens in the phloem do not happen in the xylem. Okay, they are very specific. Each and every plant is specific, and uh, the rice is specific to itself. Uh, it differs from wheat and uh, the day of growth, the nutrient it takes, the season it prefers, the uh, yield that it gives, everything is unique, okay? And within the rice, variety to variety, the transfer differs, okay? The rice that is uh, the nutrient that is a nutrient accumulation fashion in IR will be different from the nutrient accumulation fashion in Pony. Okay, within the, uh, like these things, there are different uh, physiology that is happening from individual plant to plant. Okay, so that is how it is specific, unique. So we have to identify that and use that uh, for the targeted uh, deliveries in the plant. Okay, say for example, nicotine. Nicotine is a compound not only developed in the uh, tobacco plant, it is also developed in any other plant. Say if there is an infestation happening in the plant, immediately it starts to trigger some of the pathways, defense pathways that is able to synthesize nicotine. Okay? And this will not happen if you are physically damaging it. Okay? This is all grown over a period like uh, thousands of years, millions of years, they have adapted these physiology. So they have developed that, that is specific to each and every stimuli that is given externally, okay? Say if a bee is stinging on it, it will not uh, produce those pathway that it is producing when a pest is infecting on it, okay? Because of the saliva that is uh, having its own proteases. So that triggers specific pathway that is in the uh, plant that it has developed over ages. Okay, and pollination. Uh, as you know, the pollination is happening because of so many hormonal changes that is happening in the fruit and uh, flowers. Okay, the uh, color change happens, the nectar uh, uh, secretion happens, and then the aroma comes out that helps in bringing, pulling the uh, bee or butterfly to come and pollinate the uh, plants and then the fertilization happens okay and once again the fruiting fruiting happens and uh, certain plants have there are uh, by fruiting they are uh, classified as climatic uh, climatic okay climatic uh, the fruits that is able to ripen only after being harvested the fruits that is uh, ripening in the tree itself okay these are all the different things and uh, these are controlled by specific pathways okay in the fruits that is uh, going through uh, that is being uh, conducted by a set of uh, pathways that it is following for generations okay so coming to the fertilizer okay so the present day problem is leaching and degradation okay uh, say it is applied in bulk okay in kilograms quintals okay and all the fertilizer that is being applied mostly gets leached away okay because of uh, the irrigation that is being simultaneously given okay without uh, irrigation the plant will die so both has to go hand in hand okay and sometimes it is not leaching they stay there but it uh, it, go, it, fo it forms a different uh, it gets degraded or it goes to different form that is no more available for the plant, okay? So what are all the nutrients that is to be given for the plant? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, these are all coming in the macronutrient, but this need not be given because this is ab abundantly available in the uh, environment of the plant, but you have to give NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Each of the nutrient differ by itself. Nitrogen is... Uh, Nitrogen you have to give in a more bulk way 
because it forms a more 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 most of the protein okay and it is highly mobile as like potassium and uh, phosphorus it is highly immobile okay so it stays uh, whatever the form that you give uh, transfers into an immobile form and it stays there in soil and calcium uh, magnesium sulfur all comes in the macronutrient and the micronutrient are there iron boron fluorine manganese zinc copper molybdenum and nickel and uh, although the the micro the difference between the macro and micronutrients are uh, say for example uh, nitrogen is needed in 60 kg or uh, like 60 to 100 kg per acre okay for a rice variety whereas micronutrient iron is needed in just 1 kg okay but it doesn't mean that since it is needed in 1 kg it can the plant can go even without that it uh, it doesn't mean that okay because each and every nutrient have its own role and if it is not being carried out the plant dies and the whole uh, yield is uh, lost okay say for example iron have a specific reason we 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 have been working on iron okay iron uh, availability is needed for photosystem 1 photosystem 2 as you can see it is a comp photosystem 1 and 2 are composed of definite number of iron ions okay and cytochrome for example is made of five uh, iron ions and the ferrodoxin specific a specific number of iron is there and it cannot be substituted by anything else it has to be there if it is not there this whole chlorophyll uh, photosynthetic system uh, gets affected and so if the photosynthetic system is not there the photosynthesis doesn't happen okay for the electron transport system that is followed in the photosynthesis this uh, complexes are needed and uh, if it is not need is uh, not there the light that falls uh, then uh, it cannot be harvested as uh, immobilized carbon hydrogen and oxygen that forms carbohydrates which forms the energy source for the whole universe okay Uh, not so a uh, whole universe it is for the whole world so once it is not there the photosynthesis doesn't happen the chlorosis happens uh, and then the plant dies okay and uh, since, uh, apart from that the iron accumulation also should happen in the uh, yield okay so uh, as because agricultural uh, uh, yields are the primary source of uh, nutrient for the whole population uh, if iron deficiency is being found in the plant that is reflected in the human as well you can see 1 million death that is annually happening because of the iron deficiency why this iron deficiency is so much happening nowadays it is because of the carbonate and bicarbonate ions in the soil so we were applying huge amount of nitrogen okay and the plant growth has happened uh, very luxuriously and uh, there is a huge amount of biomass that is being produced under the soil okay and this also respires and this gets gets sequestered as uh, carbonate bicarbonate and this increases the ph and all the iron that is available there in the soil and also that is being applied externally as fpso4 is also getting immobilized as oxy hydroxy forms okay so this oxy hydroxy forms can dissolve only at uh, ph range of 2 okay and this is a very acidic ph which uh, in which the plant cannot uh, uh, exist okay so uh, plant can plant uh, so every one unit of ph increase reduces the iron by 1000 times okay other way of applying iron is by uh, edth chelates okay even those chelates are uh, susceptible to fixation by carbonate by carbonate ions okay so there are some very strong chelates like edth okay but uh, these are very uh, uh, like uh, very aggressive that even it can mobilize some uh, heavy metals okay so the heavy metal accumulation are being frequently recorded when these uh, chelates are applied in the soil those plants have heavy metal ions accumulation and that can give a secondary effect 
okay so we identified the plants okay and uh, plants have two method of accumulation of iron okay that is strategy 1 and strategy 2 okay so strategy 1 plants that is all plants except the gramineaceae or grass family okay all other plants have the strategy called strategy 1 Okay, so in the strategy one, what the plant do is when they need iron, specific iron uh, promoters that is triggered in the root. Okay, and it starts exuding uh, ATPs. Okay, the, those ATPs are specific to exude out uh, protons. Okay, those protons go out of the soil. and uh, reduce the soil ph to 2 units okay and uh, this is the highest capacity of the plant say for example if the soil is 7 or 8 ph it can go up to 6 uh, ph uh, reduction okay by exuding these proton ions okay and uh, this will dissolve the iron okay uh, expected to dissolve the iron and but since it is in oxy hydroxy form in the recent days it is not able to exudate out okay so this uh, ph window we have used we have designed a material that can dissolve only in this ph and release out the iron and uh, if there is the uh, carbonate uh, bicarbonate ions these gates will be closed okay in our material design material the gates will be closed and so the iron that is available inside as fso4 will not be converting to oxy hydroxy forms this is the design that we have developed okay as you can see on the left side since because it is towards the root uh, see it is basically only 2 cm range 2 uh, cm range around the root okay this ph change happens so if the particle is residing outside the 2 cm range uh, the carbonate bicarbonate ions will be there which will be closing the polymer and there won't be any iron release the green color that we have represented here in the porous material is the iron that will not get released okay so it will not be converted to oxy hydroxy form so it will just reside there as an available form and here when the root comes nearby okay the protonation happens and these uh, molecules that is the polymer molecule bio polymer molecules which is bio compatible uh, can open up and start releasing these iron that is loaded in the porous material and the iron can be taken in by the plant that is what we have done and this is a very simple design you can see which we have we are able to publish in 10 impact journal okay so it started with mesoporous silica okay porous material that we have developed uh, following the stobers method that is uh, age old okay and it is a soft template method so surfactant ceta is used and uh, ceta forms uh, micelles as it is given here and the micelles are assembled here and once you add uh, teos triethoxylene so it is uh, highly sensitive to Uh, basic condition and this ethanol will be uh, coming out of this uh, alkyl chain and this uh, sio2 is formed and uh, when you go for a high temperature treatment or alcohol washing this uh, ceta that is residing in this poles uh, porous region gets washed out and you get a hollow uh, channel running inside and uh, this gives a huge area as well as huge surface this is the chemical reaction that is happening okay so uh, based on the pore size the, the, this material gives a flexibility to change the pore size based on the uh, like uh, soft uh, template that you are choosing okay here we have ended up in 2 uh, nanometer 2 uh, nanometer pore size with the ceta and uh, if you are increasing the alkyl chain or you are having a uh double surfactant uh, there will be an increase in the size and you can tune the size to increase okay 
and uh, if it is the if the pore size is 2 to 15 nanometers it is called mesoporous and if it is uh, uh, less than 2 nanometers it is called uh, microporous and if it is 50 nanometers and above it is called macroporous okay this is our uh, schematic so initially we are using ctap and tus to prepare mesoporous silica and then we have loaded feso4 and then uh, this is coated with ketosine. Here, the loading that we have done is with the uh, uh, low pressure uh, evaporation that we have carried out. Okay, so we have dipped it in uh, saturated solution. Saturated solution of FeSO4 is prepared with somewhere around um, six percent solution. So this solution is drenched with this FeSO4 for uh, mesoporous silica for overnight. Uh, that allows the hollow channel to get uh, loaded with the FeSO4 saturated solution. And then we apply low pressure and simultaneously we increase the temperature so that the evaporation of water happens. And the low uh, pressure helps in increasing the hydraulic connectivity in the channel uh, that will allow not to form any uh, gaps, air gap in the channel, okay? So that is how we have loaded the FeSO4 and then we have confirmed that there is no more gap with the TEM. Uh, time dependent TEM was taken in this uh, evaporation process. And then we have coated with ketosin. Here we didn't go for a solution based ketosin coating method, although there is an ionic, uh, uh, ionic uh, uh, attraction-based uh, coating of ketosin. We have gone for a gel-based uh, ketosin coating uh, where we have used centrifugal force, okay? So that uh, there is a two process that is happening, okay? When you are loading the FeSO4, saturated FeSO4 in this force, there will be a lot of FeSO4 around this material, okay? You have to remove that material. At the same time, you have to coat it with ketosine, okay? So what we have made is we have made a jelly ketosine material and added the material on top of it and then allowed for a centrifugal force so that the material travels uh, down. When it travels down, there is a gradient separation that is happening between the uh, mesoporous silica loaded with FeSO4 and unloaded FeSO4, okay? So, as you can see here, in our process, we ended up in three layers, okay? This is the jelly ketosine, okay? And when the material is passing through to the bottom, the Fe, uh, mesoporous silica with the FeSO4 loaded and coated with F, uh, ketosine is residing at the bottom, okay? Those FeSO4 that is not being loaded but just adhering on the surface of ME, uh, mesoporous silica is being separated here, okay? So then we can uh, gently scrape it and you end up in this material and this material have been uh, checked for the coating, okay? As you can see, before coating, there is a complete channel that is being uh, visible and after coating, there is no channel visible. And this is after coating and now we have to prove that this is having a, a thin layer of coating of uh, ketosine so for which we went for uh, we went for uh, tungsten tungstic acid based uh, staining and we went and uh, this is not a single particle that we have uh, we have been able to see so set of some 10 particles we were seeing, every particle that we attempted was having. There is no particle out of these 10 that is showing no ketosine coating, okay? If you try this, you will end up in the same kind of material that is shown here. And now we have to characterize it thoroughly for the uh, mesoporous silica and it's loading with FeSO4 and then it's loading a uh, coating with ketosine, okay? So first we took Fe, uh, uh, XRD, the XRD shows low angle uh, peak for the mesoporous silica and the FeSO4 shows the peak here. Since because it is loaded inside the mesoporous silica, the 
uh, FeSO4 peak got slightly shifted, and this we found that because the shift is because here it is at uh, heptahydrate uh, composition, and here it is at uh, tetrahydrate uh, composition. Okay, and then after coating with uh, ketosin, you can see even the ketosin peak here. Okay, uh, since because the FeSO4 loaded inside. It become uh, uh, it become a little suppressed, and the ketosin that is over the surface is becoming uh, dominant. Okay, and then we went for uh, TG. Okay, thermogravimetric analysis. So here we went up to seven hundred degree. In the seven hundred degree increase uh, in the mesoporous silica alone, there was thirty thirty percent loss in the weight. That uh, that is due to the uh water okay and here again we are able to see the same 30% uh, with the uh, mesoporous that is being loaded with the feso4 okay and when it is coated with ketosan we were able to see additional uh, reduction okay that is counted for uh, <coughs> here that is for ketosan okay so here this region uh this region which is additional to the FeSO4 loaded material is uh, because of the S, uh, sulfur release as SO2. Okay, this we have calculated and uh, we have been able to see. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I have confused. Okay, so uh, this temperature range that what we are getting is for uh, SO2. Okay, this temperature range weight loss. That we have got here is for ketosan. Okay, so this loss that is being uh, found both in the uh, FeSO4 loaded mesoporous silica material as well as FeSO4 loaded mesoporous coated with ketosan material, uh, this com, uh, uh, weight loss have been accounted for sulfur loss as SO2. Okay, with this we were able to quantify that. There is around uh, twenty-eight percent uh, loading of FeSO4. Okay, this is being uh, uh, cross-verified with uh, AAS reading as well. We were getting around twenty-six uh, percent, which is having almost uh, nearby twenty-eight percent loading. Okay, and this is the highest for mesoporous loading with any drug. Okay, the, we have discussed this in the paper very well. So far, whatever the mesoporous uh, silica loading have been shown uh, goes up to not more than ten percent. Okay, all these are because they are using uh, solution-based loading. What we have done is a, a powder-based loading that we have achieved that gave a significant increase of twenty percent. Okay, and this is FTIR, uh, which uh, shows the. Uh, IR uh, spectra for each of the functionalization at every stage, and uh, of course the zeta, the mesoporous silica have a negative charge, and uh, which change to positive charge after the ketosan coating. And uh, now comes the application. Okay, in the application first we have to see whether the material is showing pH based release. Okay, so we here we have taken pH five buffer. And that uh, ketosan, when it is loaded with keto, uh, coated with ketosan, there is a gradual sustained release. Okay, here there is a burst release. Why? Because at every stage that we have seen, most of it is significant. Okay, the release in the next stage is significantly different from the previous stage. Whereas here, it is an insignificant release that we are seeing. So there is a Targeted five uh, pH based release that we were able to accomplish with the ketosan coating, which is uh, at uh, pH seven, not that good release is happening with the ketosan coated material. Okay, and the same have been tested with the hydrophonic medium because basically we want to take this material for hydrophonic application, where you need not give give a repeated application based on the pH. Change in the hydrophonic medium, can the material can give a targeted release? Okay. So now we have to check our material whether it is able to sustain uh, carbonate bicarbonate. Okay. So we prepared a carbonate bicarbonate buffer of nine uh, pH, and uh, we added uh, uh, 
our material and allowed it for over time okay say for example here we have tested for 5 hours okay we kept it uh, without shaking and after that the carbonate bicarbonate ions were leached out okay after that we added this dtpa di uh, diethyl triamine pentaacetic acid okay so this uh, this is a chelating material that can chelate only the iron that is in iron uh, by uh, divalent and trivalent okay very specific so it will not uh, leach out any of the iron that is transformed to uh, iron oxide form okay so once it is leaching out then we go for a as test and we are able to see that there is a high amount of iron in the ionic form in the ketosin coated material than the material that is not having ketosin and then we came for the uh, iron binding abil uh, ability of the material composite to bind to the root okay since we the, see the root uh, have high positive charge because it is releasing out the proton when it is needed uh, when it needs uh, iron okay so that we have used here so the material is having ketosin coating which is highly positive charge so uh, when there is a, a proton release the ketosin becomes uh, protonated and it becomes positive and the root also exudes some uh, phosphate material okay that makes it highly negative charge okay so that helps in the binding of the material that we have checked over time okay so here we have kept the plant in the hydroponic with the uh, material in a constant stirring with the magnetic stirrer okay and over time we checked uh, we took out the root sample and the root sample were tested for the iron binding and we were able to see that at ph5 the root binding of uh, these material was more and this was also tested with the scm we were able to see that there is a strong binding of the material with the uh, scm image and uh, the strategy one plant have the protonation ability okay and after protonating the iron leaches out okay from the soil and after it leaches out it have to transport inside the plant right for which it have a specific uh, transporter that can transport only the iron in the reduced form that is in divalent form okay so for that the plant releases out fcr ferric chelate reductase okay kind of protein that can reduce the iron that is being leached out by the proton okay so when the plant is in deficiency ferric chelate reductase is released okay so now when we have treated the plant with our material we want to see that if ferric chelate reductase is expressed with okay so if it is less expressed which means our material is uh, delivering the iron efficiently if it is more expressed then the material is not able to uh, cater the plant with efficiently the iron okay so as you can see the feso4 is not able to uh, give control in the ferric chelate reductase much expression is there which means feso4 is not able to give the iron efficiently for the plant whereas in the ketosin coated material you can see it is showing very less ferric chelate reductase expression which means our material is able to give a sustained and targeted fashion the iron for the plant and so the ferric chelate reductase expression is lesser okay this is uh, so far what we have seen is a conventional way that is we make some uh, fertilizer that is able to uh, release in a targeted fashion okay other way of nanotechnology assisted uh, plant protection production is also coming out okay this is all mostly with the optical and uh, electronic uh, electron transport uh, uh, 
ability based on the ability of the nano materials to show optical activity or electron transport ability okay many of the semiconductor particle have been explored for this okay so here <clears throat> what happens is uh, in the photosynthesis photosynthesis is the main uh, mechanism that is helping in the production okay once your carbon is fixed as carbohydrate that is being transferred for its own growth and then it is being uh, stored as cereals and pulses okay uh, so the photosynthesis should go at the maximum only then the production increases okay so here what happens is this is a protoplast okay uh, chloroplast okay chloroplast is in the leaf and it has the uh, photosynthetic uh, electron transport systems that uh, takes the electron from the light and it transports one by one and uh, while transportation it fixes the uh, carbon dioxide that is being inhaled okay so for this this uh, cytochrome that is uh, b6f4 is needed and photosystem 1 is needed okay so the electron that transfers from here to here is through phycocyanin okay this phycocyanin is a copper based material okay copper based uh, protein that is being helping in the plant okay and uh, when you see the photosynthesis of plant it is still not as efficient as the primitive that is the algae okay uh, cyanobacteria okay so when people were studying this they found that initially in the evolution the uh, earth was highly reduced okay uh there was no oxygen okay uh, it was completely reduced and the iron was available as iron sulfide okay so it was very easily available so iron was uh, uh, uh iron was taken okay mm, iron was taken and iron based uh substitute for this wire uh, plastocyanin was there in the cyanobacteria and algae and that was helping in the electron transport uh, from the cytochrome to the photosystem okay and then the oxygen evolved okay once the oxygen evolved iron um, uh, what uh, the iron gets fixed okay so no more availability of iron happened okay so the plants evolved some of these copper complex so these copper complex started helping in the electron transport okay so in the biotechnology way what they did they introduced to those iron based uh, protein complex uh, so uh, from the algae into the higher plants and they were able to see that the production increases okay and recently what people are trying to use some of the nano material as the electron transporter and they try to see if that improves the photosynthesis okay so in this way people have used different uh, electron transport materials okay so in this way there are some carbon material as well which you know uh, have the capacity to transport electron uh, here comes uh, many of the allotropes of uh, carbon that is uh, fullerene carbon nanoparticles nanotubes graphene graphene oxide uh, carbon dots all these so okay. Uh, there was a recent paper from mit where they have used carbon nanotubes and they have seen some three times improvement in the photosynthesis so we were working on graphene oxide we will see in the uh, discussion that is going to come through so graphene oxide we were using for a different purpose so we were uh, like and it also have good uh, conduction electron uh, conduction to some extent so you wanted to use this in the chloroplast and see how it is uh, helping in the uh, enhancement in the photosynthesis okay so um, here uh, we don't want to go for a uh, like a direct study of uh, graphene oxide adding to the chloroplast and seeing what is happening with the photosynthesis so we here we prepared two form of uh, graphene oxide one is uh, reduced and the other one is uh, and reduced that is a uh, graphene oxide okay so the reduced form is one that is conjugated with uh, diethylamine aminated graphene oxide okay 
okay so this is one graphene oxide this is aminated graphene oxide having diethyl amine ligands okay and both you are adding into chloroplast and uh, you expect some uptake and you expect some way of uh, electron transport uh, modification to happen in the photosynthetic apparatus and that have to be inferred with the photosynthesis efficiency okay that is what we were trying you can see the tem showing the thylakoids having the carbon nanoparticles i mean graphene particles okay this is all once again the uh, graphene synthesis and characterization since because it is going to be already one hour okay and uh, i think uh, most of you may be uh, mm, uh, Uh, you know you can uh, you you can take little more minutes uh, maybe you can take 10 more minutes no issue yeah 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 See, and uh, participants uh, the records please uh, speak little loudly you know okay sorry uh, okay no problem thank yeah. you so uh, yeah the, like uh, it is going beyond one hour right so one hour uh, at lecture may be too boring okay Uh, so i suggested vasi why don't we have some 40 minutes but vasi said no no you should strictly stick on to plus one hour so i was little uh, maybe boring but like uh, you have to get up now okay so now we are in the climax stage we are going to finish it so who more uh, have uh, went to sleep can uh, get up now okay um, it is so, very interesting now don't think like yeah. that uh, everybody okay. see the comments everybody written as a excellent talk informative talk so it is not a boring now okay. just to continue okay now. okay, okay uh, so <clears throat> we have used two type of graphene oxide okay so graphene out of its total weight say for example if you are say taking 100 mg of graphene out of which 40 mg is uh, residing as oxygen okay and other uh, 60 mg reside as carbon okay this is based on the amount of oxidation uh, the way of oxidation that you are going through okay if you are going a very hard oxidation it goes to 40% okay if you are giving a mild oxidation it goes to 28% roughly it is 20 to 40% of oxygen that is present okay so this oxygen is present as epoxy as you can see here it will be epoxy at the uh, inside the planes okay whereas at the edge it, it resides as uh, cooh groups okay and uh, hi some hydroxyl groups are also there inside okay mostly this oxy and hydroxy groups are there okay so this we try to functionalize with i mean uh, since the epoxy is the highest and it is uh, by itself an active molecule uh, to bind the ethyl diamine okay so it binds there and uh, it forms a positively charged uh, aminated graphene oxide agu and gbo okay this we have characterized with nmr okay this epoxy is completely reduced uh, when the uh, conjugation happens in the agu when compared to gbo okay after conjugation we have been using it for uh, binding with the chloroplast okay chloroplast was extracted as per the uh, gradient centrifuge method that is given before okay after having the chloroplast we want to see how much of material is being taken by the chloroplast okay so for which we have used two methods to quantify it okay one is bilayer interferometry it is a recent technique where a microfluidic method is adapted okay a small micro channel will be flowing through where you can send one of the molecule whose binding affinity you want to find okay when it is flowing through it will be flowing through a platform okay this is called sensogram okay sensogram can be of different uh, modification where you can have your material okay so you send your uh, bio molecule in this micro channel and you will have your material here and you will find how much binding is happening based on the surface plasmon resonance okay here you will have an optical sensor once the molecule that you are sending through this micro channel binds to the thickness of this sensogram increases okay once the increase in the sensogram happens the surface plasmon resonance changes 
okay it is very sensitive to nanometer increase in the thickness okay so here you can see that the blue one is the agu okay and this uh, brown one is the gu okay so agu is showing high binding two times of binding than the gu okay this is the first quantification that we have done okay and after it binds what you can do is you can send a dissolution buffer when you send the dissolution buffer all the chloroplast that is residing here will start to uh, like uh, leave out okay when it leaves out we collected it and we quantified how much of uh, it is there in specific microliter of the material okay that we have quantified with the confocal microscope okay by enumeration and also in the tem we have taken a specific uh, size and we were we quantified how much of graphene oxide is there in each of the material okay so here this one is with the graphene oxide this one is with the amine graphene oxide as you can see in amine graphene oxide there is a huge uptake of graphene oxide okay but there is also a severe damage in the thylakoid okay that also we should accept then we went for the photosynthesis estimation so photosynthesis estimation you can do in your uh, college as well it is a very simple technique you just have to this is actually a school kind of experiment that we have used for this paper uh, once again a good paper that we got from a simple experiment okay dichlorophenolinolindophenol okay this is the compound when the photosynthesis happens the electron is electron transport happens this electron transport will cause the reduction in this uh, dye once this is reduced it changes from blue color to uh, i think uh, you are able to see this arrow right so it changes from blue color to colorless okay by the reduction okay so in this way you can quantify how much of photosynthesis has happened okay so here this treatment is with the gvo and this treatment is with the agu so as you can see with the gvo increase in the amount of gvo there is an increase in the photosynthesis activity than the control whereas here than the control the agu addition although the uptake is more in the previous slide which we have seen the photosynthesis got reduced okay this is because of the damage in the thylakoid and this damage we have quantified is through the ros generation okay that ros generation is majorly contributed from there are different ros species right superoxide species is there hydroxyl species is there h2o2 is there so we have found that there is more of h2o2 production and uh, since because gvo by itself have some ability to quench uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, this is all the back reference that we have notified that uh, because of that the graphene oxide have lesser uh, hydrogen peroxide whereas agu have higher hydrogen peroxide okay and uh, coming to next uh, two quick uh, papers okay we will see quickly and uh, we will end up in another five minutes okay so this is about pesticide delivery here we have used graphene oxide for pesticide delivery application why because uh, graphene oxide is very well proven to have the ability to take the pesticide okay that is why uh, many studies are going to use graphene oxide for the water filters okay most of the water that is used for potable purposes is having these uh, residual graphene oxide at ppb range which also can actively bind to the graphene oxide in the water filtration okay so when we use in the formulation we will have high amount of pesticide okay so it is easy to load okay when it is loaded uh, not only it binds the pesticide it since because it is having a pi pi affinity and high hydrophobicity they can very well bind to the leaf as well okay and they can uh, bind uh, strongly overcoming the drift okay here this study is uh, designed for to to overcome drift okay the formulation that can overcome the drift uh more 90% of the pesticide that we apply to the field goes waste out of which more than 30% is lost through the drift 
which we want to reduce. So for which we used graphene oxide, as I explained before. So this acts as a tethering material that brings the pesticide and the leaf to bind together and it don't get washed away and it stays there for the pest control. And here, the, we'll skip all these things and uh, yeah, uh, this alone we'll see. So although it is binding, it should release the pesticide, right? So here we have used the three mode of uh, release, which helped us to project this material as a targeted release, okay? First one is uh, change in the polarity. Change in the polarity caused the release in the pesticide, okay? This happens because it have hydrophobic proteins that take the pesticide inside the pest, okay? And the other one is the alkalinity. In the pest gut, it is highly alkaline, okay? So alkalinity reduces the hydrogen binding between the polymers. See here, we have, uh, we have used the graphene oxide to load with pesticide and this whole composite is uh, uh, encapsulated in a polymer, okay? This polymer binds through hydrogen binding, okay? So once the pH in the gut is changing, you can see a huge release in the pesticide, uh, okay? Mm, yeah. There is a two times increase in the release from the neutral to the pH 10. And uh, there is also a photothermal release, uh, which uh, I explained detailedly in the human system. The same we have shown. Why photothermal is? This is actually a concept that we have said. Uh, this can in future go through because some of the pests actively take uh, feed on the leaves in the daytime. They are called... Uh, uh, diurnal pest, okay. So they can actively feed on the daytime, okay. So when we have a material that is so efficient enough to have photothermal uh, efficiency with the solar light, you can have a photothermal release in the field, okay. That is a concept that we have developed, but this is completely done with the laser. This will not work in the field. Okay, finally, the preservative where we have used a targeted preservative release. Here uh, we have used graphene oxide and uh, this red one or the hydrozone link which are very sensitive to the acids. And this is the preservative, okay? And uh, when the fruit over ripens, it will release uh, some of the acids, malic, uh, citric and other acids. So that will, uh, that have the ability to uh, cleave this hydrozone link and uh, the release of uh, preservative will happen. And since, because this needs an application after synthesis, this material have been vacuum filtered and prepared into a wrapper like this, okay? And uh, now we come to the conclusion. So mesoporous targeted and uh, carbon-based simulated pesticide and preservative release systems have been developed. I think uh, yes, that's enough. the conclusion. Okay. Yeah. If there is any question, we can have. Oh, yes, sir. Thanks a lot for your excellent presentation, Nana. So we have received several questions from a uh, charting box of Zoom link as well as uh, YouTube link. Uh, now oh. I can open the session for the discussion. Those who are in a Zoom link, uh, please unmute your mic and uh, directly talk with our chief guest. Hari Shankar, please check anybody's rising hand. Unmute uh, their mic. Unmuted, sir. Unmuted, sir. Yes. And now this is my question. You know, well, in India, not only India, so many countries in Gulf countries, there was a big problem. That is a locust attack, vertically in Chilonia, locust attacks. Yeah, yeah. So your uh, nanotechnology pesticides, uh, can we able to control this type of attack? Is there any pesticide or uh, the nanotechnology, how it is giving the solution for this locust attack? See, locust is uh, really a dangerous one, okay? okay. <laughs> I don't think this uh, pesticide can uh, control it because uh, we, we know this, uh, like uh, this, uh, right now, since there is a season now, uh, everybody started talking about uh, locust, but like uh, this is the most dangerous thing in uh, agriculture, okay? okay? So this cannot easily be controlled. I, all, the, all the methods, physical method, and uh, see, uh, there, there are uh, like uh, uh, 
pesticide of course they apply but like here mm. uh, they they come like a war okay so they come yeah, and yes, cut sir. and they go okay so this like is supplies, like sir, mm, sir. Uh, so the whatever we have developed that is a drift resistant which is for a uh, pest uh, control for 30 days okay this locusts are not going to stay for 30 days okay it is mm. just, just going to come and uh, go away like a elephant okay that is what they, they are like hair view uh, like they yes, just yes, like a soldier yes. very difficult okay now yes now thank you now and this question was asked by pumi mahre so what are the basic difference between normal agriculture product and hydrophonic uh, vertical farming product Uh, the product uh, see definitely there will be change okay uh, mm-hmm. to be precise uh, definitely you will not get the same nutrient quality as it is in the wild okay the hydroponic yes. plant will have its own uh, it will not have all the alkaloid secondary uh, secondary metabolites okay now okay no, thank you no. then uh, again the same question uh, similar to that question cocos please unmute the participant mic some disturbance is coming so, dr nageshwar singh any harmful effect uh, noticed or uh, or not in the eatable items of our uh, daily product now can you hear me now hello sir sir can you try yeah yeah is it okay ah yes okay yes. now please now okay. see uh, if we are using these material uh, we have to follow the protocol okay, okay. say if i am uh, if uh, the nano pesticide that we are saying which mm-hmm. is used uh, it can be used only when the uh, vegetative growth happens mm. okay okay uh, when the crop enters into the reproductive growth say for example if it is wheat if it is a 60 day crop mostly mm. the vegetative growth happens for 40 days and last 20 days the reproductive growth happens okay, okay. and okay. those uh, initial 40 days protection can be hap- uh, followed with this uh, material okay okay coming to the preservative that is why we don't want any of the material to enter into the consumer that's why we have developed a wrapper okay mm-hmm. and further we are developing it okay we are going to amalgamate it with the polymer and we are going to make some uh, fruit uh, containers uh, which can hold these material uh, strictly with the uh, cardboard and uh, only the preservative will be available to the fruits yeah okay no. it basically is a... the design okay okay no. i understood and this question was asked by daily mohammed gusain so among the mesoporous and microporous macroporous material which one it is very useful for the plant uh, nanotechnology or plant growth see that uh, once again depends on the uh, specific uh, need okay no. say if it is uh, for um, taking an example i can say if uh, uh nitrogen should be delivered to the plant okay mm-hmm. uh then better go for a bigger porous material okay, okay. because the nitrogen is needed in a 60 to 100 kg per hectare per acre mm. okay whereas if it is uh, iron uh, it is needed in kilos okay so you can go for a and also it is needed in a more slow uh, fashion okay basically the release kinetics of release kinetics that is needed for the plant is specific to the nutrient okay so based okay. on that you have to use the whether it is meso micro or macro you have to choose it that is what i am saying okay now thank you now now i again open the session for uh, the participants you just unmute your mic and directly talk with our chief guest so only those who are in a zoom link you only having that opportunity utilize please utilize it sir good evening sir mm good evening sir, 
Okay, what is the financial comparison between the normal agriculture and this uh, hydroponics or vir virtual uh, vertical agriculture, sir? And uh, another one is uh, the plant uh, variety. Different plants, is it specific? The nutrients requirement is also specific. Then yeah. uh, the research also will uh, that is what your uh, the nanomaterial that are required also should be specific, no, sir? Yeah. Then, uh, it is not universal. Whereas soil yeah. is. Yeah. It is not universal. That is, that is what I am saying. It should be customized for each and every plant and each and every nutrient. Okay, sir. Okay. okay. The one we explained is specifically for, that is what I am saying, uh, the iron that we have developed, which is a targeted iron release uh, uh, material, is specific only to strategy one plant, which use protonation and ferric chelate reductase for the iron uptake. Okay. Okay. When uh, strategy two plants don't protonate. Okay. Okay. In that plant, say for example, rice or wheat, they don't uh, produce protonation in the field. Okay. If you are applying this material, uh, there won't be protonation, there won't be uh, ketosin uh, unwinding, and there won't be release in the iron. Okay. okay, so it, it is all specific to the nutrient, specific to the crop. And uh, if it is a, a nitrogen, the entire uh, uh, trigger stimuli that is uh, released by the plant varies. It is not the protonation for all the nutrient. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sir. Thank and uh, regarding the cost, see, cost, cost is relative. Okay. Say uh, why they uh, why they have initiated this? As I said, these forms are not a lab. Okay, with lab. the photo which I have given, it is not a lab. Okay, okay. it is a commercial production that is in uh, New England, York. New York. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it is a busy place where they want to avoid transportation charge. They are doing it there. Okay, and this you can see the YouTube. You you you. Okay, be you are uh, nowadays. Uh -huh. In Hyderabad, also rooftop garden is there, sir. Exactly, exactly. And uh, I think uh, actually one one um, firm uh, from Chennai, sir. I met them in IIT. Okay, uh, two young uh, boys. Uh, so they started some seven years back. I met them. So they gave a presentation. They they are very successful. They are giving a, a kit. Okay, sir. Okay. That kit uh, will have. Uh, some sachet and uh, some uh, like uh, growing medium and uh, seed. Nothing will be visible. You just go and put it in your uh, rooftop and you just add water. You will get the plant with the yield. Okay. You will get the fruit. Okay. okay. So okay. such uh, mechanization has come and this is all going. Uh, this is not only uh, in uh, for abroad and uh, of course they are doing uh, well, but like it is eventually going to be here. Okay, the uh, cost is going to be, uh, see, uh, fifth, uh, like uh, some 80s or uh, 70s, nobody would have uh, thought of the poultry mechanization that we are doing now. Yes, sir. Okay, now uh, one lakh birds, uh, the poultry, they are uh, managing with uh, some 10 uh, human resources. Okay, <laughs> right from the laying up to packing, Everything is uh, mechanized. This is happening in uh, our state, uh, Namakal. Uh, this is happening. Okay, this is nowhere uh, in foreign. Okay, uh, so eventually, this mechanization is going to be adapted. So Chennai will become a place where you cannot transport uh, from uh, Kanjipuram or uh, elsewhere. Okay, eventually, they need to have a vertical farming in uh, nearby places. Okay. And uh, one more example which I can cite is uh, when you cross through Ozu, you'll find a lot of uh, poly houses that is growing for 100 acres. Okay. This is all completely mechanized uh, flower production. If they lay a plant, it should give uh, 50 fru uh, flowers means it should give 50 flowers. Even a single flower loss is a loss. So cost, cost, cost uh, yield uh, calculation is going on. So this is eventually going to get. Uh... Okay, now thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, this question from uh, Zoom link participants, uh, Karpasami. Uh, what are the nano fertilizers are available in the market today? 
see uh, this is uh, like um, uh, what, what a kind of uh, argument that is happening okay uh, really uh, uh, you you should follow certain rules that is recently given by uh, dbt okay recently uh, in 2020 uh, one of the meetings uh, science and technology minister have released a uh, protocol how to Uh, follow the uh, nano fertilizer production and uh, utilization okay so you have to follow it uh, but there are many if you uh, just google it uh, there are many coming but like you have to strictly for see that whether they are uh, following it or not because uh, many um, unrecognized or like uh, unorganized sectors are there so you have to really look into that properly okay Okay, now thanks a lot. Now still we have a lot of questions, but because of the unavailability of time, so we cannot able to read all the questions. Thanks a lot for your excellent talk, now. And for the participants, I would like to say one thing about our chief guest today. Uh, chief guest, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar, he has a publication in uh, Chemical Society Review, uh, first author publications. Uh, the impact factor of that uh, review article is forty one. so that much excellent guy and he is a very good hard worker and he is doing lot of work i have seen directly fortunately i had a chance to work with him and uh, nearly 4 months am i correct na so 4 yeah, months uh, I, or 5 yeah, months by, by the time wasi joined i left yeah yes, so, yes, that, yes, that is too much wasi is okay uh, you see everybody work hard <laughs> all, all of us work hard right i don't yeah. think any indians uh, in this area especially research area there yeah. is no indian who is uh, working less hard yeah because of this uh, ftp i thought that to bring a different field of uh, uh, persons uh, yesterday one person from uh, me- medical divisions and uh, today agriculture divisions uh, then i only found uh, you are as the agriculture person and also you are one thing i want to stress for all audience as yes, okay yes na yes uh, um, i said uh, you have opportunities to visit many labs and you can like do hmm. okay but like mostly see um if you try to refine uh, the knowledge okay you can get a very good uh, publication okay it is not yes. that uh, the lab and the facility makes the publication as you can see many of the work that we have done misoporasliga there is nothing new, new material okay and it is all already refined uh, so thousands or uh, 50000 publication or 1 lakh publication may be there okay so it is all the way you explain the, and you uh, design the methodology okay these things so you should have a consistency to put and if you don't have consistency then you always have today because of uh, the revolution in internet every day one journal is coming okay whatever you write you have some place to publish okay um so that is hard so that part i think uh, we all should uh, le- uh, see sometimes my students also say like uh, uh, so everybody goes through okay we, we submit to some five journals and uh, seven journals mm-hmm. yes. till it gets uh, rejected so then they want yes. to put it uh, somewhere else okay uh, mm-hmm. i i i don't say that i will not put in any uh, like uh, journal, journals uh based on impact factor i will classify them and i won't publish there i won't say that okay you have to go there but like uh, in the um, series of uh, um, submission okay for each journal there will be some focus area okay so that makes you to uh, refine your results okay based on that okay that gives more idea so it is even though your material like you think uh, um, your work uh, 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 may not deserve it i think uh, you should give a try that is what i strongly suggest okay don't get straight away go where they easily accept okay that is uh, that uh, if we uh, researchers follow this and then uh, the winners are uh, those people who run the journal just uh, open the journal and uh, yeah they sustain yes yes 
thanks a lot for your kind information huh? and uh, thanks again for your uh, valuable time spending with us during this pandemic period now i hand over the session to mercy thank you sir for spending your valuable time with us in covering many areas in nanotechnology like its uses in medical sciences targeted drug delivery system importance of iron and its deficiency in plants iron fertilizer application and so on surely your session would be an informative one to many of us and also thank you for patiently answering the queries and finally we are going to end this day night session it's time to propose vote of thanks on behalf of bs abdul rahman crescent institute of science and technology department of chemistry i deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion first and foremost i thank god the almighty for making today's occasion a resounding success then i would like to give a heartfelt gratitude to our speaker dr p dr p s vijay kumar sir his presence has made the whole whole session informative thank you so much sir for joining us and a sincere thanks to our coordinator dr n vasimalai sir assistant professor selection grade who took a great effort to make this program valuable and a special thanks to our conveners professor dr s kutirani ma'am dean school of physical and chemical sciences and professor dr ishwar murthy sir head of our department for creating this platform to enhance our knowledge and skills even during this pandemic period and uh, and we are very much thankful to our technical team of this 14 days fd program who are working behind the screen without them the program will not be fulfilled thank you all for your support last but not least thank you all the distinguished participants for your cooperation and active participation without you the session is incomplete once again thank you one and all tomorrow date and event of this fdp will start at the same time from 4 pm to 5:30 the invited speaker of tomorrow's session is dr c ratnaraj professor department of chemistry iit karanpur your valuable presence is encouraged kindly join 5 minutes earlier in the zoom to avoid the connectivity problem participants can also subscribe chem crescent channel for the videos of past 8 days and also for the upcoming videos thank you thanks a lot mercy and thanks a lot for your excellent presentation thanks for seeing okay so venga